I'm thrilled that you're joining me here. My name is Marilyn Evans. I'm the founder of Parents Aware and host of the Media Savvy Moms podcast, the podcast that is leading the conversation about parenting and pornography today. When I say the words human trafficking, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Kidnapped, overseas, impoverished, or maybe you think of street kids and runaways. Rarely do we think that human trafficking is impacting our kids, but it does. Whether they're victim or not, trafficked or not, human trafficking has become part of the culture that our kids are growing up in. It's part of the media saturated world. So today we're going to be talking about ways to empower young people to take action and to take a stand against sexual exploitation. And to do that, I have a good friend and an honored guest here. Her name is Cheryl Pereira, and she is the founder and president of One Child. Now this is the first organization in the world empowering children and youth to combat the sexual exploitation of children. And they do this through prevention education, through advocacy, through survivor care, and survivor empowerment. Uh, One Child benefits over 79,000 individuals in 11 countries around the world. They have been named as one of the top five Canadian charities run by young professionals. And Cheryl brings a very engaged perspective to this conversation that I'm going to let her tell you about. But just before I do, I want you to know that she is the recipient of over 28 awards in Canada, including the 2018 Order of Ontario, 2017 L'Oreal Canada Woman of Worth Award, and 2005 Canada's Top 20 Under 20 World of Children Founders Award which is recognized in the media as the Nobel Prize for Children. So again, we are so honored to have you here today, Cheryl. Welcome. Thank you so much, Marilyn. I have told our listeners a little bit about what you do, but can we hear from your perspective about One Child? What is your mission and how is it unique among other organizations? Sure. Um, Well, Marilyn, we are um, the first organization in the world that's empowering a youth-led movement against the sexual exploitation of children. And we do that through prevention education, advocacy, survivor care, and survivor empowerment. So what makes us different is that we are a children's rights-based organization. And at the core of our work is Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And what it does is it gives every child the right to have a say in matters that affect them. So we believe that since this issue is affecting children, children themselves should have a say in developing solutions with adults. So we recognize the power that children have, their energy, their creativity, their uh, dynamism, their tech savviness. And at One Child, we want to harness that creativity um, and, 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 and use that for good. So we provide youth with education on the topic and tools, uh, training, mentorship to build their capacity as advocates. So this looks like our youth empowerment coordinator delivering educational presentations and running action planning workshops in schools. It looks like providing training to youth in how to meet with their elected officials, give presentations on the topic, raise awareness or fundraise. Um, It looks like running a youth advisory squad to ensure there is youth voice and that is featured in all major conversations around this topic and that it feeds into the development of programs and policies. And, you know, as a result, we have youth all over Canada and the U.S. who are changing risky behaviors, raising awareness in their communities. They're challenging popular culture. They're lobbying governments in the private sector for child safe policies. And they're volunteering with organizations that work on the root causes of this issue, and they're raising funds to provide rehabilitation and reintegration support for child survivors. That is incredible. I love that concept of of giving youth a voice. That is something that I'm very passionate about. That's really why Parents Aware exists and Media Savvy Moms. We do it in a different way. We're informing parents 
to talk to their kids about these issues, but it's for that same purpose because we believe that kids have a fair, they, they deserve this fair warning and they deserve to have their voice in issues that impact them. And rarely do they, as you know, Cheryl. Mm -hmm, absolutely, absolutely. I love so much what you're doing. Now, you came into this work, you have a unique story. Um, and it started in high school. Can you share with us that story? Sure, yeah. So I started, as you said, you know, in high school, um, and it was a result of a reading, you know, researching for a high school project. So I just, you know, it was a regular school project in my grade 10 civics class. And I took a trip to the library and took out of this book. And as I was flipping through this book, my eyes fixated on a description of the child sex trade happening in Thailand. And what I read, you know, it floored me, the thought that children my age and younger were being exploited in such a way. Um, it just made me angry. And I knew I had to do something. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I was going to do something. And so from there, I decided to do more research. And I learned um, that Sri Lanka, so my parents are originally from Sri Lanka. And I learned that Sri Lanka was home to about 40,000 children who were trapped in sexual exploitation in the country. And so I knew I had to go overseas and go to Sri Lanka and travel around the country and meet these children, ask them what their stories of exploitation and abuse, and ask them what I could do to help. And uh, so I, I, I managed to convince my parents and my high school principal <laughs> to let me take off three and a half months off of school um, so I could travel to Sri Lanka. And so I traveled around the country meeting with these children and hearing their stories. Okay, I'm gonna pause wasn't... you. I wanna hear about their stories in a minute. So yes. you convinced your parents and your principal yes. that this was something that you should do. What was your parents' first reaction to this? Um, I, I think, they were initially, I mean, it was initially like, there's no way that's ever going to happen. But I think I had kind of mastered the art of wearing your parents down to the point <laughs> they give in. Um, and so I, uh, I had, I had, yeah, I really had mastered that art. And so, you know, I, I, my parents could see how passionate I was. Um, they believed in my, you know, maturity level. And um, in the end, I got their blessing. And then with their help, I went to my high school principal. And then she also said, yes, I, you know, do, you can do it. Just take your homework with you. Take your homework with you. Okay. <laughs> We're going to hear what kind of experience that you had, which is, is be above and beyond anything that we, our kids normally would receive in high school. And I just want to preface that, that I think your parents sent you to stay with relatives and they may not have had a full awareness of what you were getting into. Is that correct? Yes, I think they thought that I was coming there for vacation. Uh -huh. And then when I, you know, was spending time, you know, walking around in the streets, talking with children who were living and working on the streets and trying to visit different NGOs, um, I think it was, a, it was quite the uh, surprise for them. But in the end, you know, they got behind it and they, they knew I was coming there. Okay, so I'm not going to interrupt. I want you to continue with what happened when you got to Sri Lanka. So I, I, yes, I was traveling around the country meeting with these children, um, children who were living and working on the streets, children who um, had been victims of sexual exploitation. I also met with social workers and the NGOs that were working with them to kind of pick up the pieces. I also met, met, met with law enforcement and government officials, but that wasn't enough for me. I kind of wanted to get as close to the issue as possible. And so uh, what I did was I wanted to kind of, I knew that there were undercover operations that happened um, that were there to rescue children and to catch child sex perpetrators. And I knew that there were organizations that ran these undercover operations. And so I thought to myself, you know, I'd like to join one. I'd like to watch it happen. And, you know, again, that perseverance that I had, you know, from the very beginning kind of kicked in. And um, I contacted several organizations. They all said, no, um, you're not, you know, you're not a cop. You're, you're 17 years old. And, you know, I stayed, as I said, I stayed perseverant. And I contacted one organization there called the National Child Protection Authority. And they're the government branch on child protection. And I sat with them and said, I sat with the chairman and said, hey, you know, like, I, I, I'm so passionate about fighting for children's rights. You know, I've, I've come to explore this issue. Is there any way I can do an undercover operation? And then he sat back in his chair and he started thinking. And in my head, I was thinking, okay, he's going to say no, he's going to say no, here comes a no, like everybody else. And then he said, actually, yes, 
you can play the main role of the decoy. So what the police were doing um, is that they were tracking a man. He was married with two kids. He was the assistant general manager of the finance department of a multinational corporation. He had been posting on a child pornography site that he was interested in young girls. And the police had been communicating with him and wanted to actually meet him in person. And they needed somebody to go in and play that role of this girl. And so that was my job. Wow. So I was playing the role. Yeah, I was playing the role of a 15 year old girl. And I, over the course of, you know, um, uh, two months, I learned how to work with spy technology. I learned how to fake an accent. And on that day, I ended up meeting with this man. His idea was, if you like the way that I looked, we would get up, he would make a, he would make the payment and then we would get up to go to a hotel right after. Okay. And for the police, that was their cue to move in and make the arrest. Uh Um, And so I met with this man over the course of an hour. He spoke to me in very graphic detail of the kind of sexual services he was interested in getting from me, who we thought was a 15 year old girl. Uh And I had to remain calm as I, he talked to me as just an object to be bought and sold, just a commodity. He, in the end, decided that he did like the way that I looked and he paid me the equivalent of $20 Canadian. And as we were getting up to go to a hotel, the police moved in and they arrested him. And, you know, I, I, Marilyn, I, my, the experience of going undercover, you know, I, I remember jumping into the police van and seeing the man in handcuffs and the police officers were giving me high fives. And I thought to myself, this man is off the street. He can't hurt a child, uh-huh. another child. And then I began to feel, you know, when the police dropped me home that day, this complete shift happened where I began to feel very dirty, you know, when I was able to really think about what had just happened, you know, and all I did was wash my, uh, all I did was, 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 you know, talk to him. And all I wanted to do was to take 10 showers and wash my mouth with soap. And I thought, if I feel this way, how must the children in Thailand feel serving up to 26 customers a day? So that experience truly opened my eyes. As you gave your story, which I have heard in the past, it still sends chills down my spine as a human, as a, as a mother, and, and just as somebody who is so concerned about children. And, and we, we tend to distance ourselves from this issue because it's too hard to think about as you know, in our society. Well, but these are real people that are buying and, and selling children and they're real children that are experiencing this trauma every day. And I, I just, am, I applaud you for what you were able to do. I think that Part of me thinks you were absolutely crazy to do that, Cheryl. And it's certainly not what you ask youth to do in your organization, is it? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but I really appreciate also the the that you sharing the feeling that it left you with. And and I think that's what we really need to to pay attention to is that we're dealing with people and and that means we're dealing with feelings and we're dealing with emotions. And and we have to come to terms with that. So I think I was, it's going to ask you what was the biggest obstacle you faced, but I feel like you, you have answered that question is that mostly you were a youth and you wanted to help, but everybody kept saying no. Was, was there anything else? No, that, that really is it, uh, Marilyn. Like, you know, in, in, in every movement, there's always power dynamics at play. So certain voices are heard and others are left out and it may not be intentional, but it happens and it's only disadvantages the movement. And I found the same with this movement when I first started and I still do to, to be quite honest, even today, um, as a young person taking action on this issue that was affecting my peers, it was my right to be able to say something and be listened to. And yet it, it wasn't happening, you know, as, as a young person who was passionate about this, I contacted several leading organizations on this issue, asking them to help, asking for me to help. And I was met with silence. You know, I, I remember going to an event to watch a respected speaker on the topic. And when I raised my hand and asked, what can you do to stop the sexual exploitation of children? He told me to tell my friends to stop watching pornography. And well, he's not wrong there, but youth want to do more than just change behaviors. They want to change laws. 
Um, and so, you know, out of frustration, I decided to start One Child to give young people a place in this movement. And then I was faced with kind of having to constantly prove my worth that we, that we, you know, that we were knowledgeable on the topic and that we had valuable things to add to the conversation. And so we had adult run organizations try to undermine our efforts to, um, to, to when we were trying to influence the Canadian private sector, thinking that they could do it better. So in, in this movement, um, we'll only be successful if we see children, not just as people to consult or as beneficiaries, but as partners in action. That's really powerful. Thank you for sharing that. I ha- I honestly hadn't thought of it that way myself and so I'm 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 glad that we're having this conversation and we can and really bring that point across that it doesn't take a bunch of adults with a lot of concern over bureaucracy and and how things are are done for action to take place we need to listen to the young people and their voices and that you had to prove your worth is is also interesting considering the topic that we're discussing. Now you also mentioned that there is a connection between pornography and child exploitation and not everyone that we speak with makes that connection. Why do you think that's that is and how do we bridge that gap? Mm -hmm. Well I think for starters Uh, viewers of pornography tend to think, or at least they're convinced, they've convinced themselves that everyone involved in pornography has agency, that they've consented to the use of their photos and videos, they're having fun, and they're making a lot of money out of it. But we know that videos of people under the age of 18 are also found on mainstream pornographic websites. So under Canadian law, if pornography depicts those under 18, it's illegal because the law takes the view that those under 18 don't have the ability to consent. So they don't have the faculties to truly comprehend what they're getting themselves into. So all of that to say that when it comes to children, they aren't able to consent. So any child abuse imagery on these mainstream websites have been uploaded without their consent. They may have been created by youth themselves who may have thought that they were sending the materials to their boyfriends, but then they were uh, victims of extortion, or their phones may have been hacked, or it may have been traffickers or buyers of children who have filmed their exploitation and rape of their victims online. And so what's important to remember, as was in the case of Pornhub in particular, these videos are downloadable and can be viewed over and over again. And every time these photos and videos are looked at, it's like a child is being raped again and again. Um, There there have been cases of former trafficked children calling on mainstream pornographic websites to take videos of their abuse down. And some have had to go to the lengths of even posing as their own lawyers just to have their requests taken seriously. Um, It's also important to remember that traffickers and abusers they often show adult pornography to their child victims as a way to prime them for what's about to happen ahead or what's, what's, what's down the road. Oftentimes the pornography that they show to them is very violent and they're expected to participate in those same violent acts in real life. Um, I think that viewers of pornography tend to, and uh, they, they tend to and want to forget that it contributes to the objectifying of young usually female bodies. These girls are not seen as humans. Um, They're just seen as objects for male pleasure. Now, popular videos and photos, they show very young looking girls, some dressed as children or as schoolgirls. And I think this helps to kind of create a demand for real life sexual encounters with younger and younger people. And oftentimes the adult sites that sell children or advertise, they advertise them as girl, they advertise their girls as very young. And that's a cue to the buyer that they could be under 18. Mm-hmm. Um, oftentimes pornography depicts, again, very, very violent acts being done to these young girls. And this is what buyers expect in real life when they purchase a, a, a child. Um, and I think, so I think what's missing in our conversations is how viewing pornography feeds the demand for younger and younger children, how that often results in purchasing children or abusing children in real life. Um, I think what we need to understand is that the child exploiter isn't always the creepy guy trading videos and pictures of children on the dark web. Like, yes, this happens, 
but it's the everyday guy that participates in these two because he watches pornography. They're our friends, our family, some of the most trusted people around us because child abuse images are now mainstream. They're on mainstream pornography sites. Yes, yes. So, so many layers, so many connections between trafficking and pornography. And, and as you said, it is, it has become mainstream as is finally been coming to the public's eye through the expose on Pornhub that was done by Nicholas Kristoff in the New York Times article, which, which we have discussed on this podcast as well. So, you know, you've been working at this for many years and you've seen that connection from from day one but we're we need to get that conversation out into the public conversation so that we can understand what pornography is really doing to young people and the fact that it's being you know it doesn't even have to be made of the children but it's being used to groom them to accept these sex acts it's grooming them to be prepared for what's coming their way Now, we've talked about some really heavy, heavy things today. So what is one message that you would want to leave parents with? What would you want them to know? I I think you've talked about a lot of things that you want them to know about uh, child trafficking and the misconceptions, but what can we do differently as parents? Mm -hmm. There, there are, there are quite a few misconceptions. Um, You know, for one thing, you know, while, kidnappings have happened most of the times it's not someone following you and your child in a walmart parking lot or you know tempting your child with a lollipop in a white van you know that's too much of a headache for traffickers because trafficking is meant to be a uh, a low risk high profit profit crime mm-hmm. and so um what you know traffickers are often the people who are actually closest to children their family their friends their boyfriends even their parents And they prey on weaknesses that the child has and they try to gain their trust. Um, So it's so it's not really about this, this kidnapping. um, And we see a lot of these misconceptions um, kind of spreading through through social media. And so we really we really need to change that. We're recording this at the end of January, which is Human Trafficking Awareness Month, at least in the United States. And so there's been a lot of posts about human trafficking. And I, I heard a parent ask the question, well, you know, if my children aren't at risk, if they're just at home, do I really need to be concerned if they're playing outside? And I thought, wait a second, we're missing, we're missing the point here because trafficking, as you said, isn't about being in the wrong place at the wrong time and being picked up by someone in a van. Exactly. And, and the question about playing outside is more so what are they playing on when they're online? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that's what's really very, very important to remember. And, and trafficking can happen to, we, we like to say that any child is at risk. Yes, there are certain groups that are at higher vulnerability. Like for instance, if you are a foster child or if you're um, a runaway or you're homeless, but really any kid, as long as there's some sort of vulnerability, there's something lacking, whether it's they're not getting enough love at home or they have a low self-esteem or they have a mental health problem. And the trafficker is meeting that kind of vulnerability. They're providing something that they aren't getting the child is at risk. We have had cases, many cases of children who have been trafficked uh, while they were still living in their parents' house Mm -hmm. or going to school. We had kids, you know, who have been trafficked um, and then they go, they go to school at their lunch break and after school, their pimp or the trafficker picks them up and then takes them to a hotel and returns them back the next day. So this can really happen to, to anybody, but, um, but we need to understand that there are of course certain groups that are more risk, perhaps if they're indigenous or if they're black or if they're LGBTQ, these are, these are groups that are tend to be at a higher risk, but any kid is at risk. Yeah. And one thing I've learned, because we did have the mother of a trafficked victim, on the on the podcast and not all who are trafficked recognize that they are being trafficked you know she she was a bit older when she was she had been in a relationship with her boyfriend and then trafficked and it wasn't until she got out of the situation and had spoken with victim services to understand really what had been taking place. So I think we have a hard time as parents imagining, well, how could my child, how could a child, 
be picked up from school, be trafficked, return home. And this continues on and on. But it's those vulnerabilities. Every, everyone has a vulnerability. And the traffickers are expert at exploiting those vulnerabilities. So how can, how can we get young people involved to end trafficking ex and exploitation? And I'm, as I said before, I don't think you expect that all young people that want to get involved should get involved in the way that you did to begin with by going overseas and uh, doing a sting operation. It's, it's not as risky as that, is it, Cheryl? Mm -hmm. No, not at all, Marilyn. And, and you know, when I do usually give presentations in schools, I like to give a disclaimer and say, do not do what I did. Um, but what, you know, there are many opportunities for children and youth to get involved and they have more power than they realize. Now, I was a regular high school kid when I learned about this issue and couldn't see myself standing on the sidelines. The first thing I did was really educate myself and they can do that too. And they can do that by going to our website. So it's www.onechild.ca and getting informed. Now our website is specifically written for young people. It has youth friendly knowledge um, that they can get. Um, and they, once they have this education, they can start spreading this knowledge to their friends and family. Um, if they want to take it a step further, they can email us at youth at onechild.ca to join us in our advocacy efforts or to run a fundraiser. Um, there, there's, there's many different options of getting involved and according to different to someone's level of experience um, in social action, but it starts off with simply educating yourself about the issue. So exciting to hear that you have given a voice to young people to get involved. So to recap, children do need a voice. This is their issue and we need to provide a voice for them because they have, they have skills and creativity that, that as adults, we are not as proficient at. And so one child is giving our kids a voice to do that. And then we talked about Cheryl's own experience in Sri Lanka and how that made her feel and the realization of how this does impact real individual children. And problem is more vast and more deep than we realize, but it's not so big that we can't do something about it. Everyone can do something to raise awareness. And then we talked about the impact that trafficking or the connection between trafficking and pornography and how many layers there are to that. And so when we're, one thing that we can do is to bring awareness to the harms of, about the harms of pornography. And as we do that, that is also helping to mitigate the issues of human trafficking. Once again, One Child is designed to help young people, our youth, get involved, to lobby, to become active, to, to make changes in their communities and bring awareness to a cause. So just one more time, Cheryl, can you give us the information of where children can get involved? Uh, give, us, give us a challenge for this week. Sure. Um, so I guess my challenge to parents listening is to go to our website, to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, our handles are at One Child Network, and you can go on our website, which is www.onechild.ca. Our website splits into two kind of websites. One is for youth, that's written in youth-friendly language, and the other one is written for adults. And if, if your child is 12 or up, they can go through the resources on our site. They're full of stats, facts, Mythbusters, resource guides to help youth digest this issue and take action. And the same thing goes for adults. So if you're looking for information on how to, for instance, recognize the signs in your child that they might be trafficked, you can you can go onto our website. If you're looking for, for facts and stats, you can find that on our website. Um, so really go on there, digest all the information. That's the first step to taking action because knowledge is power. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you again for joining the conversation. If you'd like more information about what was discussed in this episode, visit our detailed show notes at parentsaware.info. And if you simply want to follow us on social media, we are at Media Savvy Moms on Instagram and Parents Aware forward slash Media Savvy Moms podcast on Facebook.
Until next time, keep talking.